And as they're making their way downstairs, let's take our Bibles up here, upstairs to Mark chapter 15. Take your Bible to Mark chapter 15. Wonderful account. Recorded for us in Scripture to give us a beautiful picture. I just, I've, I've, I've seen this before. I've read through, obviously, if you, if you read through Scriptures, you see these things. I've read devotionals that bring this up. Jesus dying for our sin on the cross so that we could be set free and be saved from the judgment of a holy God for our sin. He took our place. Jesus did and suffered for us. This is clearly pictured in an account recorded for us. Now think of this. In all four Gospels. It doesn't happen for every, everything that Jesus did. There are some uh, uh, accounts, some things, activities, teachings, miracles of the ministry and life of Christ that show up in all four Gospels in those we take special note of. This one is in all four Gospels. On the day that Jesus is crucified, we meet a man by the name of Barabbas. He becomes a picture of redemption and forgiveness and salvation through Jesus' death. Because there were three crosses that day. And one of them belonged to Barabbas. And Jesus took his place. It's right here in Mark chapter 15. We're going to begin in verse 6, and we're going to go down through verse 15. Mark 15, verses 6 through 15. And there are four words that give us the, the full picture this morning from this passage. Four words that jump out to us, and I'll put them on the screen as we go through our study. Dying for our sins. Look at Mark 15, verse 6. Now at that feast, so there's our first key word, at that feast he released unto them one prisoner whomsoever they desired and there was one named Barabbas which lay bound, there's our second word bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder guilty in the insurrection and the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew. Now we have to get our third word through some of the references here. For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him, Jesus, for envy. So behind that, what's behind that? Is Jesus really guilty of a crime, or are they just jealous? Right? Verse 11, but the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And verse 14 gives us our third key word by way of, of putting all the thoughts together. What th Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And so our third key word is innocent. Innocence. And they cried out the more exceedingly, crucify him. And our fourth word is found in verse 15. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released. There's your fourth word. Released Barabbas, a known criminal guilty of murder unto them, and delivered Jesus. The king of the Jews, no fault, no evil in him, when he had scourged him to be crucified. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, defines the gospel for us, and it's what Easter is all about. 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Right? The gospel. Verse 3, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, defines the gospel for us. And the gospel is what Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, celebrates. The gospel 
is the heart of the celebration. I'll use the word Easter. To many people, the word Easter means spring weather, bunnies, chocolate, flowers. I don't care. It just means a lot of things. Just like Christmas. The word Christmas means family get-togethers and snow and a season. But Christmas is a celebration of a person just like Easter and the word resurrection gives us the better idea. The resurrection is a celebration of a person. And that's this person is, is what the gospel is all about. There are two parts to the gospel. Right here in 1 Corinthians 1, or 1 Corinthians 15, there are two parts to the gospel. The first part is the crucifixion of Jesus, how that he was crucified, died for our sins. That's the idea of crucified, died for our sins. It tells us why he was crucified, according to the scriptures. The second part is the empty tomb. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Or verse 4, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So the gospel is the heart of the celebration of, of resurrection, and the second part is that empty tomb. We're going to look at the cross this morning. Mark chapter 15 gives us a perfect picture of what the cross means. You with me? First Corinthians 15 says he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Mark 15 gives us that picture, that truth in a picture form. Barabbas was guilty, Jesus took his place as the innocent one. And so the cross means substitution, forgiveness, pardon. What's our fourth word I pointed out in Mark 15, verse 15? Released. Released from our bondage because of what Jesus did for us. So let's look at these words. Start with me in verse 6, the word feast. The crucifixion of Jesus in verse 6 of Mark 15 took place during a feast. What does it say? Now at that feast. If you do your study, do your research, most of you probably know this already, it's the feast of the Passover. What was Jesus celebrating with his disciples before he was arrested? He was celebrating the Passover. This feast was a reminder for the Jews of how God brought them out of bondage in Egypt. The word feast has the reminder of what God did for them. The Passover that they're celebrating is a picture of, they, they break bread, they drink the juice, they have the lamb that is slain, the blood put on the door. So number one, this feast, the feast of Passover, has the blood in it. On this day, as the children of Israel, Israel were in bondage, now you got to keep that word bondage in mind, released from captivity, because that's going to be the main theme. On this day, as they're in bondage in Egypt, they take a lamb, they kill it, they put its blood on the doorposts of their homes in Egypt, and that night, the death angel passes through the land. And here's what the Bible says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You guys get the connection now? Pass over, pass over, and it was passing over in judgment. There's no judgment for that house that had the blood on the door. The lamb that died would rescue the firstborn child in that home. And it, now think about it. It is at this celebration of this feast that Jesus becomes the sacrificial lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. John the Baptist said in John chapter 1, Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. 1 Peter 1 verse 19 says, We are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the feast, at that feast, was the celebration of Passover, where there was the reminder of the blood of the lamb that was slain so that they could go free. But then there was also, and that's in verse 6, this picture of celebrating this feast, the release. Look at verse 6 again. Pilate commemorated this feast for the Jews by releasing one prisoner every year. Now at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desire. I've read a lot of commentaries and trying to figure this out. I haven't found one. I'm sure it's out there because my resources are limited. But I did not find one that explained why Pilate did this. Was it, was it some ritual that some other governor started? Or was there that influence of the Jewish high priest who said, this is a great feast for us. Can you help us commemorate it by releasing we don't know why this all started, but this is what happened every year. Pilate commemorates.
celebrated this feast for the Jews by releasing a prisoner. That was a reminder of what God did for them when they were in Egypt. Pharaoh released the Jews after the final plague. They were set free. They went free. They left. They, they were brought out of Egypt. God delivered his people from bondage and slavery and set them free. So the prisoner, verse 6, being released was a reminder of how God delivered them from their bondage in Egypt. So now we know what the whole context is, don't we? Why bring Barabbas up? Why have Jesus and Barabbas side by side and give the people a choice? Because the children of Israel are remembering a feast that reminds them that they were once in bondage with no hope of being released, and God released them through the blood and through that final plague when Pharaoh finally said, leave. All of this is pictured at the feast of Passover, and it's all pictured in Jesus. Second word, verse 7, bow. So Barabbas is brought to our attention in verse 7 now, and, verse 7, there was one named Barabbas. We have no idea who this guy is. We've never met him before. Read your scriptures. We don't, we don't run into him. He shows up in all four accounts only at this place. And we do know just by assumption, I could be wrong with this, but just by assumption that he's bound with at least two others because there were three crosses that day. There were probably other prisoners who were going to be crucified at another time. But we all know this. There were three crosses on Mount Calvary when Jesus died. So there were at least three prisoners sentenced to death. Bound. Are you with me? Verse 7. Which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him. Who had committed murder in the insurrection. I, this is the next four words in my notes. And he is guilty. <laughs> he is bound and he is guilty. He committed murder. He rebelled against Rome. By the way, in John's gospel, he's also called a robber and a thief. This man's clearly guilty. We have no, no question about that. We, the, 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 the text doesn't even try and defend the man. He's condemned in his guilt. And there's no way that he's going to be rescued. This is his death. It's over. The cross is already there. He's bound in his chains. He's condemned to death. You know what this pictures? Barabbas pictures each of us as sinners. Romans 3.23 is exactly what the Bible says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53 makes it clear that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way in rejection of God. Now listen, no, we may not have killed someone. We may not be a robber and a thief, but we have all broken God's law. That's the teaching of scripture. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, when we compare ourselves among ourselves, the Bible says we're not wise. And we look at Barabbas and we say, yeah, he's guilty. Man, he killed somebody. That's wrong. You can't do that. Well, I didn't kill anybody, so I must be better than Barabbas. When we compare ourselves with others, we are not wise. When we compare ourselves with the word of God pointing us to a holy God and his standard, then we all must admit our guilt. Because the Bible, listen, the Bible makes this clear. There is none righteous. That's the standard. There's none righteous. No, not one. There is none that doeth good. There is none that seeketh after God. And we like to pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, I love God. Well, as a believer, you have that love of God put in you. Before you became a believer, you were just like all the other sinners saying, God, I'm going to do my own thing. But when God convicted you, the gospel was proclaimed to you, you stopped and God opened your eyes and you said, wait a minute, I'm a sinner. Jesus died for me. I want my Savior. I want salvation more than I want my sin and eternity in hell. That's the difference. What Jesus did for you, not because you're good, because I'm good. None of us is righteous nor perfect. We have all broken God's law. We have all come short of God's holiness and glory and perfection. And because we are all sinners, now think, just keep following along with me, right? Bound, 
condemned? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. None of us are going to escape that. Here's what the Bible says in Hebrews. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. No escape. In fact, Ecclesiastes says there is no release from that war. Speaking in reference to death, there's no release. I am a condemned sinner facing the wrath of a holy God, and I will face it. I will die. I will be condemned. John 3, verse 18. Remember John 3, 16? John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, and for God so loved the world, amen, whosoever believeth on him, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Not he's going to be condemned, he's condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Here's Barabbas, bound! And it's just simply a picture of you and I. Bound in our sin. Slaves to sin. Not able to free ourselves. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Don't blow by this word bound and Barabbas and say, well, poor guy, poor chap, you know, he, was, he just, he shouldn't have done it. No, the Bible records this for us because there I am in my prison. There you are in your prison. We're bound by sin. We're condemned by God's holiness. We are under God's wrath, just waiting for the moment we leave this earth to stand before a holy God and be condemned forever in hell. And then there Jesus comes. Right? Did that happen to you? Did it happen to Saul of Tarsus? Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus. Did Jesus come into your life? There's no escaping the wrath and judgment of God. It's appointed on the man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Barabbas pictures our sinful, condemned position. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot undo our sin. We need to be rescued. We need to be saved. And so, number three, the word innocent. I like how all the other words are in the text. I couldn't, this word's not in the text, but it's very clearly part of the text, isn't it? Because what does verse 14 say? Remember, look at verse 14. What evil hath he done? All right, so here's Jesus. The multitude starts to ask for a prisoner to be released. Verse 8. Look at verse 8. The multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. So Pilate, now just a little bit about Pilate. We're not going to get into him a lot this morning. Pilate sees his opportunity to release Jesus. Verse 9. He obviously wants to release Jesus. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now, so this is his opportunity Pilate knows the man's innocent, so he says, okay, the crowd's going to ask for Jesus. Why would they want Barabbas, a known murderer and, and, and insurrectionist? They'll definitely say Jesus, because Pilate wants to get rid of Jesus. He knows and sees something different in Jesus. Remember, this is the same Pilate that went in and said to Jesus, what is true? I mean, the man's under conviction. Jesus came to deal with with man in his sin. And Pilate stands as that kind of uh, picture of all of us that have to confront Jesus or my way and understanding. Jesus, the truth, the way, the truth, the life, or contenting the people and following my own political uh, understanding and my own way that's going to make me happy. Pilate stands as this kind of, he's the only one really, besides Herod, who was out of it, Pilate's the only one really who stood before Jesus and was able to ask questions and be confronted. He's under conviction. Pilate's wife, by the way, Pilate's wife had a dream about Jesus. He, she told him, don't have anything to do with this man. God is trying to get Pilate's attention. So Pilate wants rid of him. He, 
he tries to release Jesus to the people. He knows that Jesus is innocent. Here are the two ways we know that Jesus is innocent. Number one, because he saw that they delivered him for envy. Verse 10. For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. And it gets even clearer, verse 11, but the chief priests moved the people. Remember verse 9? Do you want Jesus, the king of the Jews? They moved the people, verse 11, that he should rather release Barabbas. Why would you want Barabbas as a murderer and not your king? Because the Jewish leaders were jealous. Envy. Verse 12, Pilate answered and said again to them, What will you then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? So you're going to get Barabbas. So what, what do you want me to do to this one who didn't do anything wrong? Jesus, verse 13, they cried out again, crucify. First time we see that word in this text with Barabbas. Crucify, crucify, crucify. He's going to die. But notice, he didn't do anything wrong. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The Jews as a whole rejected Jesus. They did not want to repent of their sin. Led by the, the, the hypocritical religious leaders, they did not want to turn from their wicked ways. John 3, chapter 3 says, Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So the leaders, verse 10, they want to get rid of Jesus because they don't like all the attention that he's getting. They don't want the conviction of this righteous man. They call him that, this righteous man around. They're full of envy and hatred and jealousy. Pilate sees this. He knows that Jesus is innocent and so delivered for envy. That's the first clue that he's innocent. But the leaders moved the people to choose Barabbas over Jesus, verse 11. So Pilate asked what he should do with Jesus, and it's crucified. Dead. The interesting point that we're seeing here is that there was no fault found in him. He was delivered for envy. Second way we know that Jesus is innocent is because the governor himself. Pilate makes the truth clear in verse 14. Verse 14, then Pilate said to them, Why, what evil hath he done? It's Luke 23, verse 4, where Pilate says these words, I find no fault in this man. The Bible. The Bible is making it clear that Jesus was innocent. Jesus himself said, which of you convinceth me of sin? No one could find fault in Jesus. He was just, he was righteous, he did nothing wrong. And all the trials, remember before Caiaphas, before Herod, before Pilate, all of the trials proved the innocence of Jesus. They could find nothing wrong with him, no fault in him. They had to eventually lie. To get him condemned. But Jesus will be crucified. Verse 14. And they cried out the more exceedingly. Second time we see it. Crucify him. Verse 15. The deliver Jesus at the end. To be crucified. The innocence of Jesus is very clearly seen. But he dies on a cross made for a sinner. He will be. Right? He will be Barabbas who was certainly guilty, proven guilty, no question about it. Jesus will hang between two other thieves as a picture of the condemnation and judgment of sin. Skip down with me. Here we're in Mark chapter 15. Go down with me to verse 27. Mark 15, verse 27. It wasn't just Barabbas. Here are the other two, the one guy that Mark Bishop sang about. Look at verse 27. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand, the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So what we're getting here is a picture of an innocent man dying in the place of a guilty man. The innocent son of God died as a guilty sinner. He carried the sin of the world upon him, numbered with the transgressors. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That's why we are seeing, that is what we are seeing when Jesus takes Barabbas' place. The innocent dies for the guilty. The just dying for the unjust. What does the Bible say? Is that Isaiah 53? God laid on him. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his stripes we are healed. And that takes us to our fourth word. By his stripes we are healed, forgiven, released, set free, 
saved. So our last word brings it all together, because this is the whole point of the, of the account. Starting in verse 6, he was going to release somebody, because that's what he did at this feast. Here's our, in, our guilty man. Here's our innocent man. And guess who goes free? Our last word in verse 15. Barabbas goes free while Jesus is condemned. Verse 15, and so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. It all comes together. We understand it. We see it. We, are, we understand what God is trying to show us here. That, that the, the opportunity to be released would go to a guilty man while an innocent man would die. Pilate released Barabbas based on the substitution of Jesus. Because Jesus took Barabbas' place, his cross. Barabbas was set free. Here's a question I put in my notes, and just an interesting question. Whatever happened to him? We don't hear anything from him at all in Scripture. Nothing. We have no idea what happened to Barabbas after this. We have no idea. All we know is that he was once under condemnation and sentenced to death. But then he was set free and released from that judgment. That's all we know. Did he ever accept Christ's sacrifice for his sin? Did he ever find eternal life and enter the kingdom through faith in Christ? We have no idea. But we have that opportunity this morning, don't we? At some point in your life, you would have had that opportunity. If not, then, then now you do. Has God set us free in Christ? Has God released us from the bondage of our sin and death and took our place so that we can be released? This is why Jesus came. Remember Isaiah 61.1. Jesus quoted this at the beginning of his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the, gu the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So Galatians 5 verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Hebrews chapter 2, Jesus became us. He took on himself the form of the children of Abraham. So that Hebrews 2 verse 14 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2 points out this deliverance that God, that Jesus brought to us as he takes our place on the cross. The bondage delivered from the bondage of sin and death. And Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members. Guilty. To bring forth fruit of the death. But now, listen, we are delivered from the law. That, the law being dead, wherein we were held. That we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Delivered. I'm, I'm, I'm just reading scriptures that give us this picture of being delivered. Because released, because Jesus takes our place and sets us free. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Free, released. God wants to release sinners and set them free in Christ. And it's ours to receive. Barabbas is so interesting, isn't it? And that's why I asked the question, if Barabbas ever surrendered and repented of his sin and accepted Christ's sacrifice for his, for his salvation. Because Barabbas is a physical picture. Barabbas was not spiritually saved and going to heaven. And his sins forgiven because Jesus took his cross. He's just a physical picture. 
But the physical picture gives the opportunity to Barabbas and to every single sinner before and after Barabbas that we can have spiritual salvation, spiritual release, spiritual deliverance, spiritual life in Christ. Because he died in our place. Dying for our sins leads to being released. The Passover pictures release and freedom. Right back to the feast. The Passover, it's all release and freedom. So that guilty sinners like Barabbas can be set free. Because the perfect innocent lamb of God would die in his place. Guilty sinners like us can be set free today because the perfect Lamb of God died in our place. Jesus carried Barabbas' cross to Calvary so that he would die in his place. Jesus carried that cross for us so that he could die in our place and give us freedom from our sin. Have you accepted Jesus' gift of salvation? The most important question. Barabbas got set free. But he still didn't have life. Have you accepted Jesus' gift of salvation? That's what matters. Have you been released from the condemnation and judgment of your sin? Let's pray together. What a picture, Lord. Thank you for it. Thank you for this. It didn't have to, this account did not have to happen. Jesus was going to die on a cross, and yet you give us this man's name. Just a short little picture. Of a man we never met before and haven't heard of after. Because you want us to know what Jesus is doing. Barabbas was guilty. Guilty as sin, like we said. And Jesus was innocent. And Jesus died at his place. Lord, help us know in our hearts that we're guilty. And that Jesus died for me. I can be saved from the condemnation of my sin. Not a physical cross, but an eternal hell. Because Jesus took my place. Lord, I pray that each one of us, as I'm praying, each one of us is saying amen and, and saying, yes, thank you, God. If, if there's one here that's not saying that, Lord, you work in their heart to show them they're still in bondage. And Jesus died to save them. And they can be saved if they'll repent, turn in faith to you. Thank you for this wonderful picture as we celebrate our risen Savior and we rejoice in the life we have in him because he took our place. It starts with the cross. And we're rejoicing in that cross that sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen.